Welcome back. It's your boy Japanese Tutor doing the Dutch again. It's uh, winning with the uh, Stonewall Dutch. And we're going to go to game two. We left off at game one. We finished game one. And now we're going to look at some of the ideas in game two. Um, this is a game that was played in 1987. All right. And I'm just going to go through the game. T4. E6. C4. And actually, I'll turn this around because we're learning it from the black side. So I'll turn it around. F5. Oops. G3. Knight of 6. Bishop G2. C6. Knight F3. D5, getting the classic stone wall, right? And especially these two, these three pawns. Oops, sorry, not that one. C6, knight of three, D5, castles, bishop D6, B3. And we already know that if they play B3, they're looking for this bishop A3. So we know to play queen E7 here. So that they cannot trade off easily. Because if they play here. Right. We're just going to play here. Push. Okay. Queen e7. Just as suggested. Bishop b2. B6. Queen c1. Now why do they play queen c1? The idea is very simple. They play queen c1 because they really want to play bishop a3. And what does bishop a3 do? It kind of forces us to trade off our pieces. And our grip of e5 is weakened. So then ideas like knight here, knight here, knight here, knight here are really good because now they control the this square right here, the e5 square. So that's the plan. So queen c1. Uh, and he says in the book, uh, we know this move from the inspirational game b, which we saw before. And they said castles. As we shall learn from Game three, this move isn't as obvious as it may appear. Bishop a3, bishop b7. If white puts his knight on c3, bringing the bishop to a6 is very natural. Now, however, when all options are open for white, it is more logical to put the bishop on b7. Black prepares c5. And in general, the pieces should point towards the four central squares of the board. These four squares. So bishop catches g6. Bishop catches g6. Queen a3. C5. And they're saying that another sideline, queen captures a3 is perfectly playable. Um, and there was a game in 1955 that continued. Knight captures a3. Knight bd7. Rook fc1. Attacking on the queen side because this is where the play is. Rook fc8 saying, hey, if you're going to play there, I'm going to play there as well. I don't want you having any initiative here. Knight e1. King f8. Knight d3. Controlling this square and this square. Maybe... Some hops over here are possible. King e7. Rook c2. And c5. And this is about, it has equal chances. It is worth noting that in this line, black would have preferred not to have castled. So it is better to not have castled because now your king is wasting moves coming back to the center. So let's go back. And so in this game, we played, uh, instead of taking on a3, we played c5. So this is right from the book. This central clash is typical for the entire modern stonewall. The, num the great number of possible pawn captures and 
recaptures is a great starting point for a good fight. In general, piece activity and concrete calculation is extremely important. Okay. Um, there was one thing that somebody once told me. Um, there's something that somebody once told me. Uh, oh, F Twilight, thank you for hosting. It's if you give your opponent three or more ways to capture, usually they take the wrong way. So just think about that. So I'm going to go back to the chat. Uh, I'll stick around. This is even more perfect. Great. All right, we're going to go back into it. So after C5, oh, he goes, in this exact position, activity may seem approximately even, but it will turn out that white's queen is badly placed, unless white can win the C5 pawn. But it's too, it's risky having such a powerful piece so far away from the king's side. Here's a question. Do you consider black to have a big advantage here? In general, the author... Uh, does not think in some in such uh, terms. He just plays and hopes for the best. <laughs> During the game, that he was a bit nervous about his C pawn. However, as a theoretician, you just have to draw some conclusions. And actually, yes, perhaps black is already a bit better. But the real mistake comes a few moves later. So D capture C5. White, if white delays, sorry, let me just go ahead here. If white delays clarifying the situation in the center, black may suddenly change his mind and start taking back on c5 and d5 with pieces instead. Knight c3 is the critical line. So instead of d captures there, knight c3 is the critical line. Leading to a tense and complicated position. Maybe knight e4 might be my my choice uh so c5 bam bam and then knight c3 right now and then knight bd7 rook f to d1 so this is a very very natural looking move and in this case it gives it dubious the reason uh, I guess, well, first of all, the reason it's it looks natural is because you always want to put your rook um, in front of the queen. Even though it's not directly in front of the queen, if something happens, then it is going to be in front of the queen. So just based off of principles, this is a good move. It looks like a good move, but it's actually a mistake, and it's a very instructive mistake. During the game, he thought that e3 would be necessary. Instead of rook d1, he thought that e3 would be necessary. But now he realizes that black would be absolutely fine. So, like, let's say he did play e3, then black would be absolutely fine after d captures c4, b captures b4, knight b6, attacking the pawn, rook f d1, queen e7, right? Is that e7? Yes, that's e7. Queen e7. Knight d2. Sorry, knight d2. Bishop captures g2. Oops. Oh, wait, knight d2. Sorry, I missed the move. Knight d2. Oh, bishop ca this bishop catches on this. G2. Uh, king captures on g2. Rook a d8. Queen b3. E5. The hole on E5 has become totally irrelevant, as so often happens in the stone wall. So if you can get this push with no repercussions, I think this is a push that we should do. Um, this is what at least the book is saying to us. Because of this line, white should take on D5 first. So going back. So going back here, instead of e3, white should play c captures d5, e captures d5, 
and now only e3 because now that stops the f4 pawn the f pawn and the pieces behind it from joining the attack but this is uh and this is totally fine for black and this is totally fine for white as well uh, both sides have compensation it's about equal uh, we would then have a typical hanging pawn structure where the pawns are here are hanging um more about this a little bit later uh but not right now and where white would have time to centralize his rooks and put pressure on the pawns however black shouldn't have much to worry about and at some point he perhaps may throw in g5 in order to support f4 after okay so let's go back so the move he played was rook, rook fd1 so after rook fd1 we play f4 and this seems like this is the common like break for for black so we got to keep that in mind now black becomes very active White has just moved his rook from f1 to d1, hoping to make the other rook useful on c1. But it is more important that black's forces now outnumber white's forces on the king side. So, he, rook ac1. a6. a6 is awesome. And it just prevents knight b5, and it just has it stops you from having to calculate knight b5 at every single line. Bishop h3. Mm, I don't know about that. And it gives this a dubious. White continues with his own plans, but this weakens the f file even more. Rook a to e8, saying, hey, look, I'm playing over here. You can play wherever you want, but I'm going to play over here. Uh, rook c2. h6. And... I remember being very satisfied, or the author remembers being very satisfied with this move. It may prepare g5, and it's always nice to have a luft for the king. A luft is an escape square. Luft is uh, air in German. So, but mainly, it emphasizes white's lack of good moves or even plans. So knight a4, maybe attacking here. Doesn't seem so good because this knight's always here. This appears consistent with white's previous moves and if the c pawn was actually hanging, it would be great. But the tall Icelander leaves his king side just much too open. Perhaps bishop g2, just admitting that this was a mistake is better. Ninety-four. Oh, sorry, that's ninety. That's ninety-five. Ninety-four. Simple chess by Black. While White puts his pieces on the edge of the board, he instead puts it in the middle. So here's a question. I can see that Black's attack is now becoming dangerous. At what point did you realize you were winning? Actually, one of the most, and I'm sorry to say this, I, I say there's no stupid questions, but he says, one of the most stupid questions I get during games is, how's it going? How should I know? That depends on what I'm going to do for the next few, move, next few moves. And if I should go around answering such silly questions, I would definitely lose concentration. And then probably the game as well. The moment you start thinking, now I'm winning or anything similar, it's time to pull yourself together and concentrate on the position. You do not want to be distracted. Okay? Never be distracted. If if you're winning, there's now there's more chances for you to lose because now you're le not looking at the game anymore. Your opponent is now really focusing on co to come back. So really focus on your game first. And then when you win, you can say, I had a winning position here. Focus on making every move the best move you possibly can make it. Um, I often tell my students that good players are like monsters from horror movies. You can uh, 
hurt them and you can really hurt them. They have more vicious words here. <laughs> but they won't lie down. Even after you have confirmed that they're not coming back, they just keep coming after you. So never relax. And your opponents are just like that. Relentless. They will come after you. So C captures D5. C e captures D5. Bishop captures D7. White remains unaware of the dangers facing him, but now there's no way back. After the opening of the e-file, all of black's pieces are ready for the final stroke. Queen captures c7, knight captures c5, knight captures c5, rook captures c5. If queen captures c5, rook c8 is an important point, as stated in the text. So knight captures here, rook captures e2, knight d4. This is a nice knight, but in chess, the most important piece is the king. The abandoned white monarch is easy prey for black's heavy artillery. Takes on g3. The rest is simple tactics and a logical punishment of white's careless play. F captures g3. Okay, and uh, queen f7, and he resigns. He resigned in view of here. Check. King has to move. And then d4 with checkmate following. You sacrifice a piece. And then checkmate follows. This was an undisputable success for black. But if you feel that black was balancing on a knife edge and that an improvement for white could have changed the theoretical verdict, we shall examine a calmer approach. Okay, so we're just going to go back to a new game, switch sides. Okay, and we're going to go into our second, well, this is game three now. Also, if you have any questions in the chat, feel more than free to go ahead and ask. I will try to answer them to the best of my ability, but hopefully we're just learning for right now and there's a lot to learn. So D4, E6, a lot of people like E6. C4, F5, G3, Knight F6, Bishop G2, D5. Uh, the black player doesn't really worry about this. Uh, his name is Rune. Uh, Rune doesn't worry much about this. Knight h3. But eight years later, he had a difficult times in his uh, game in the Olympiads. Um, but they're going to cover that in a later lesson. Knight f3. c6. Castles. Bishop g6, b3, and as we know, we should play queen e7. Bishop b2, the alternative way of exchanging dark square bishops should be the a4, a3 maneuver. As we shall see, both plans have their drawbacks. And of course, here we play b6. This is the most precise move order and not only directed against the plan, white also executes in this game after castles instead of that. Um, white also has the option of knight e5 and after b6, he captures d5. So let's go into that. So let's say instead of b6, we castle. He has the option of knight e5 and if b6 and c captures, C captures, and then how do we capture C captures? He has a trick, knight C4. Ooh. And as we shall see, 
it may be okay for black after knight c6. But if possible, black should avoid giving up white this option. Uh, recapturing with the e pawn, e capture d5 is always a good, a good option if you like these structures. So going back, maybe you should just take with the uh, c pawn instead. If you like the, this structure. But in general terms, we think black should avoid these structures unless he gains activity very quickly. Okay, so let's go to the b6. Um, the most precise move order. So queen c1. And against queen c1, we play bishop b7, I believe. Let me see. Okay, so he wants to note that instead of queen c1, if they decide to play knight e5 now, bishop b7, c captures d5 c captures d5 is absolutely fine for black as white doesn't have the option of knight c4 and in this kind of position with an open c file both the white's bishops are actually restricted by the central pawn formation while black has excellent diagonals for his bishop who would argue that a black bishop on a6 is weak the idea that black's pawns are fixed on light squares and that consequently the white bishop on g2 should be strong is totally absurd because this is just hitting a brick wall and we can always come to a6 and have other we can we can do other things with our pieces so very nice point okay so bishop b7 or sorry you can see one bishop b7 he said that um sometimes you can castle here as well um, but the question is, in game two seem convincing. Why do you show this as alternative for black? In this game, uh, the black player demonstrates how he can easily achieve a comfortable equality against queen c1, but the stone wall is a rich opening. And in many positions, what you do is just a matter of taste and possibly your position in the tournament table. If you really need to win, then you should really and seriously consider Black's approach in that game. You should castle instead. Even if it may objectively be slightly inferior. Bishop a3. And now he plays bishop captures a3. Ooh, I don't like this at all. You never capture first. That's one of the main rules that I try to follow. Never capture first. You're always helping your opponent if you capture first. You help them develop a piece. Queen captures a3. Queen captures a3. Knight captures a3. King e7. I do like this though. Um, so this is a side note. Let's go back to here. On Bishop captures a3. This is surprising as the black player obviously appreciated the idea of keeping the king centralized. Knight bd7 uh, is more accurate. And then after queen captures a3, after knight white, after the knight captures on a3 instead, um, white can continue with his classic maneuver. So let's go over the classic maneuver of this. Uh, Maybe he can go to, sorry, knight c2, e1, and then d3. But it is more poisonous just to leave the knight on a3, put the queen on b2, centralize the rooks, and then perhaps continue with b4. Okay. So queen captures a3, queen captures a3, knight captures a3, king e7. Now there's little doubt that the king belongs in the center. White's problem is in these uh, end games is that he cannot take on d5 too early. Okay, as black can simply reply with c captures d5 and happily place a, a black bishop on a6. So basically what they're saying is, you don't wanna take here too early because if you take here too early, we're gonna take back and we're gonna take it this way. Or if you like the structure this way, maybe you can take back and now we can play bishop a6, right? We always have that option.
So king e7, knight e5, knight bd7, knight captures on d7. If this is necessary, the white's whole setup is a failure. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, white is already struggling to find good work for his minor pieces. Um, and black can be better in some final positions uh, if the bishop on a6 can work. And usually the white bishop, the white's light square bishop is pointing at a rock. This is a rock because it's protected by these two, right? This isn't even moving anywhere. And if we do take, then we always have this. Okay. So knight capture g7. Okay. And there's a question right here. I understand that you consider the c8 bishop at least as strong as the one on g2. And when looking at the position, I tend to agree. But what should be the conclusion? Is there no truth in the old rule that you should put your pawns on squares of the opposite color of your bishop? The classicists and even the hypermoderns um, try to make chess a game of general rules, which is actually really bad. But as John Watson points out in his fantastic book, Secrets of Modern Chess Strategy, modern players are more interested in winning games than following rules. Is this true? The basic rules are there as a bottom line, but thankfully in every position is unique, leaving plenty of scope for individual judgment the way to develop your intuition is to analyze lots of positions. Eventually, you will gain the experience necessary to break rules with success. Okay. Do I use the Dutch? And if you do, what do you watch? Can't we start with f5 instead of e6? Uh, they're going to go into order finesses later on. I would probably go with the f5 route, but that limits your options, right? If they're playing d4, most of the time they're going to play c4 because a lot of these players are playing the king's gambit, but you can also play e4. So you have to be comfortable playing a French defense or you have to be comfortable playing a Sicilian. That's just something you look out for. Okay. And I'm focusing. Sorry, sorry, Ray. <laughs> so knight captures d7, rook ac1. All right, and b4 is also another idea that they point out. Um, a5, preventing uh, b4 and sometimes breaking with the a pawn as well. So we have two plans with this. Rook fd1, bishop a6. Now attacking here. Now our bishop is doing way more than this bishop here. This bishop is just biting on rock. And now e3. And now we play b5. Whoa, this is kind of crazy. Black is the first to make an active advance. C captures b5. C captures B5. Okay. C captures B5, C captures B5, and then Bishop F1. B4. And I don't know if we should take. Rook takes. Hmm, but okay, they played here. Knight b5, bishop captures the knight. Bishop captures b5. Rook h to c8. Objectively speaking, this should be a clear draw. But white is rated a lot higher than his Norwegian opponent. Moreover, uh, he's a junior with a heavy responsibility to win this game. So, king f1, king d6, getting their kings more active, king e2, 
Exchanging on d7 would certainly lead to a completely drawn rook endgame. Okay. Knight b6. King d2. Rook capture c1, rook capture c1. Oops, rook capture c1, rook capture c1. Rook c8. Rook b1. h6. A3. Rook B8. Maybe in some lines we're going to take here. Take, 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 and push and push. Maybe. Uh, Rook B8. A catches before. A catches before. King C2. Rook c8 check. King b2, g5. g5, rook a1. Oh, oops. Rook a1. Rook a8. Rook h1. Rook c8. So they're just trying to find a place to put it. Uh, bishop e2. And then f4 striking here. Um, so let's go this. What's this? Are they trying to take risks to win? He doesn't consider himself particularly talented, but his fighting ability is obvious. So that's great. And he also defeated Kramnik in this uh, championship as well. Very nice. So e captures f4. G captures f4. Bishop g4. Rook g8, attacking the bishop. And then after bishop h3, f captures g3, h captures g3, e5, d captures e5, king captures e5, rook e1 check, rook e1 check, and king d4. Now there's no way back. <laughs> Rookie 6. 97. Captures h6. Knight c5. h4 check. King e5. h5 check. King d4. Bishop f5. Adriv was uh, very ha probably happy with the development and the active play of his opponent. That was perhaps his only chance to win, but his optimism soon backfires. Right. f8, f4. Okay. It's a very, very complicated position to kind of evaluate as well. You know, they have two, but then the king is very active as well. I would say this is about even. And play is only on one side, so that favors the knight. Okay, so rook f8. f4, rook e8. Rook h2. King e3, exclamation point. Hey, uh, Will Wolf, the Dutch. Yeah, um, you always wanted to play it. Um, yeah, I'm actually reading a book. It's not by Simon Williams, um, but I I want to go over a whole bunch of different books on openings, middle games, and stuff like that, just so everybody can get better. Um, thank you for joining the stream as well. And he's saying uh, right here, what a great king. Oh, welcome, welcome home from the, the movies, King Dave. You haven't missed much yet. There's a little like a uh, game of the Dutch, and we're going some instructive games right now. So king e3, rook h1, knight e4, bishop g6, 
attack in here. Rook F8. E1, check. King D2. White is now hard pressed to hold a draw. Rook G1, question mark, exclamation point. So kind of dubious. Knight F2. Maybe getting more play here, more play here, more play here. Um, rook g2, pinning. King e3, rook g1. And now he plays d4, saying, "Hey, I'm going for, I'm going for a queen." Now it's clear that White is in uh, grave danger. The d pawn is a major force. Bishop e1. Okay, and d3, g4, rook captures f4, g5, rook g4, rook e1 check, king d4, rook e6, and rook captures Okay, so this game already looks super decided, and it doesn't need any more comments. It looks like uh, we're going to win as well. We have to worry about this, so maybe some stuff, stuff like that. The king can also come in here, right? So we... I mean, there's a lot for us right now. This, this is a pretty easy game to decipher. So I really want to go some over some of the nuances in the opening because that's that's really where the the fun is. Oh, I love the emotes, spam. Let's do this. Thank you. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm about to post a ton of games with me playing the Dutch. Obviously, only the ones I win. Look, do what you got to do. Do what you have to do. I would love to see some games, and then we can all benefit from seeing you play the dutch i'm gonna start playing the dutch more myself that way i can get some more expertise in the opening and i'm learning along with you guys there's a lot of stuff in here that i didn't know like i didn't know you should play queen e7 i didn't know that you had to you know try to not to trade off the dark square bishop so now i know the plans for the dutch so if somebody ever tries to play the dutch stone wall against me i know what to do and that's the point right you just want to get better as a chess player not just saying, hey, I just know how to play an opening. Get better as a chess player, and that will translate everywhere. So e6. All right, so e6, c4, f5. Okay, I do like this move order, though. So the reason, okay, so the reason maybe not f5 immediately. Hmm. It's because you don't want to give up your plan so easily. It's saying, hey, let them let them play first. Now that you now they know you're going for a Dutch, right? So maybe they'll play like Bishop G5 instead. And as Dutch players, we should know not to play here because then they can just take our bishop and we don't really have anything. So we have to be careful. But instead of this, I think E6 kind of just prevents this. Right? And if they play C4 here now they don't have that annoying move now we can play this see i think that's one of the uh kind of tricks that um that white has i remember there was a, a lesson on that like maybe 13 years ago i remember here something about that like if f5 play bishop g5 if they play h6 they they weaken their king side um after you play like h4 or something so e6 f5 might be a better alternative but we can find like how to finesse a little bit you know we can always play e6 d5 c6 and then later play f5 saying hey we're gonna play the semi slav and then it's like psych we're gonna play the dutch <laughs> Hey, you're a chiropractor. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. 
So I want to go over some of the finesses that they have over here already. Just remember, if you're new to the stream, this this is just everything. When they play the B3 line, they're trying to trade off this bishop, so you make it a, a little bit harder for them to do it. Um, you can do this plan as well, A4, bishop A3. Okay, but if they do play bishop B2, the recommended line is B6. And if queen C1, there's two moves. This is a little bit less... Uh, this is more if you're going for a win. This is correct. This is more correct. Or this is a uh, theory, if you will. But castles is also playable. They're saying that so you sometimes you don't want a castle because sometimes you want your king in the center. Because the king in the center is better for the end game. Okay. So I'm going to go... Over another game. And this is going to be game four. This is in 2004. This is uh, Kwanzaa versus Alexander Moisenko in the 2004 Open. And this is in Gulef. Okay, so G4, E6. This move is very common. Actually, the third most popular move to D4. And actually, so I play e6. So before I was playing the Dutch, I used to play e6. Or I, I play e6, right? The reason I play e6 is it's so flexible. You don't know what black's going to play. I can play e6. I can play d6 after. I can play b6 after. I can play d5. I can play knight f6. I can play here. You know, if I play like e6, c4, you know, knight f6. Now this becomes a uh, Indian game, and now if they play here, then we can go into the Nimzo Indian defense. If they play knight f3, we can go to the Bogo Indian, right? You just don't know. So this is why maybe it's so flexible, and you don't tell your opponent your plan immediately. They choose something, and then you're like, you know what? I'm going to play this. Okay. So uh, d4, e6, and... So, sorry, I'm going to read from the text right now. It's the most, this move is actually very common. Actually, the third most popular reply to d4 after d5 and knight f6. It has some independent points, but in order to make use of it, you need to be prepared to, for the French defense, which would occur after e4. Therefore, we shall only provide a complete repertoire for those willing to play the genuine Dutch with f5. So c4. It has been claimed by that Botvinnik preferred to reach the stone wall via this move order because he feared the Staunton Gambit. All right, so let's look at the Staunton Gambit. What is that? I don't, I don't know. d4, f5, and you play g4 or e4? e4. Um, he says that we strongly doubt this explanation more likely he appreciated the difficult decision white had to make in this position maybe he should play g3 instead g3 which is the main move after d4 f5 is the option only uh after e6 if white is comfortable with uh c5 and the catalan line that arises after d5 also knight f3 is a small concession as d5 as it may lead to a queen's gambit where white's king's knight has been committed to f3 a bit too early. As in the Dutch, all knight h3 options are eliminated. And c5 may also be a useful option for black, depending on the repertoire preferences of both players. Note that e note that e4 then completes a transposition into the open Sicilian. And so that's why they always say that uh, after e6, c4 is their most uncompromising reply. I also want to go in and note that if you play e6 and they do play e4, you don't have to play the French defense immediately. You can just play the c5 and you can have like a Franco-Sicilian defense. Okay. But that's, a, that's another line for another day. So uh, d4, e6, 
Oops, not the e5. e6, c4. Um, are you forced into a French after they play e4, after you delay f5? So I just pointed that out. You don't have to play the French. You can play c5. Um, if they play e4, then you can play b6 as well, going into the Queen's Indian. Uh, just added e6 to my repertoire. Yeah, awesome. C4. Okay, and then we're going to play. So the text moves C4 is white's best and most uncom uncompromising reply, but still allows black to enter some lines like uh, bishop B4, which lets you go into another opening. Right, like if you play bishop B4 and they play here, then you can play here and go right into an into Indian defense. This is a transposition. But you, um, we'll, we'll go more into that. Because I, I want to focus on the Dutch. F5, so G3, knight F6. Bishop G2, C6, knight F3, D5. B3, bishop G6, castles. Hmm. A force early castling is an imprecise per se, only in combination with the exchange of the dark square bishops. Okay, interesting. So what they're saying is that castling early is in maybe he should play here, but if you exchange the dark square bishops first, maybe castling isn't correct because maybe he should stay in the center. Interesting idea. Okay, so. Bishop b2, castles, queen e7, bishop b2, castles. Queen c1, and then there's a move b5. It's a little bit, uh, it's like a, not a novelty, but it's more like, do it with your own study like results may vary or your mileage may vary kind of thing this arguably is a critical reaction to white's exchanging scheme as it effectively brings white's plans to a halt on a very theoretical level in the stone wall black should try to keep the queen side closed while generating counterplay on the king side but such abstract concerns are losing their relevance in contemporary top-level chess and are being replaced by more concrete considerations. Question. Could you please be a bit more concrete? What exactly are these considerations? The answer. Many calculations and computer-assisted home preparation, but also variations over the old trial and error method, enormously enhanced by huge sorry enormously enhanced by huge database databases allowing you to quickly extract other players experiences too so he's saying that in the top level uh before it was you're supposed to keep this side closed you're supposed to keep the queen side closed don't push this keep it closed and generate play on the king side now we're looking saying hey we have engines to do the work for us instead of us going through every single move saying, hey, this doesn't work, this does, this that doesn't work, this doesn't work. Um, and we can take from other players' experiences and games and say, hey, that didn't work in that game, so let's see if I can find a solution or maybe I can find something better. Knight BD2. This is a natural developing move. Bishop A3 appears pointless where black can meet it with b4, right? So bishop a3, you can meet it with b4. But you will nevertheless find a discussion of it together with some other temp moves, most notably uh, 95. So for now, boom, a5. Now, black's queenside activity levels the chances. Okay. 
and he's going to play knight e5, bishop a6. Queen c2. This plan is no longer relevant, so it doesn't need the queen here, right? Queen c2, rook c8, c5, bishop c7, knight d f3, queen e8, knight e1. Knight bd7. Isn't this hanging? Oh, sorry. Sorry, wait, wait. Hold on. Okay. This is move... Queen c2. Rook c8. C five Bishop C seven Knight D to F three. Okay, my it, I'm right. Queen E eight. Oh, I see. I see what it is. Okay, never mind. I I was because he always has this capture and takes here or the rook takes here and then now this bishop is active. Maybe that's the point. And then e5 becomes a threat as well. Uh, rook e8, knight bd7. Queen e8, knight e1. Knight bd7. So what happens here is that you can play bishop b7 as well. Uh, you can also play b4. It's saying, hey, I don't really need any activity. This, this knight is not doing much. This bishop is not great. This bishop is bad. This bishop is bad. So maybe you have a lot of compensation for that. Huh. And then if like knight d3, then knight d4 kind of just solves a lot of the issues. And then we also have like knight takes here eventually i see so it comes with some threats definitely comes with some threats okay so knight bd7 knight one to d3 knight captures on e5 d captures on e5 knight d7 f4 it looks like white has a lot of space. Knight d7, f4, b4. Okay. That was a lot of moves, but I just wanted to make sure that my questions were answered too. Like, hey, why couldn't he just take? But it doesn't really benefit white to take. And now you know the reply as well. Just say, hey, you want a pawn? Take a pawn. It's yours. But now I'm going to get active. And thank you for letting me get active. And the C pawn is going to be weak. Okay. Um, so. He says. Now, uh, now his challenge is to keep. Enough life in the position. To create a realistic winning chances. Or to create realistic winning chances. Uh, you have demonstrated three different ways for black to handle the bishop b2 line, but they all look fine. What's your recommendation? There isn't, and it, the answer is, uh, there isn't much practical experience with uh, this b5 system, but it seems very playable. Actually, we believe all three recipes are sound, but from a theoretical viewpoint, we assume that the b6, uh, queen c1, bishop b7, queen... Oh, so let's go back to that line. Uh, after this, after queen c1, it's the bishop b7. 
line is the most convincing as black equalizes comfortably. Usually white in the opening has an advantage. Um, and blacks tries to try to neutralize that advantage. Okay. This is the most convincing as it equalizes. However, in our opinion, instead of white playing there, bishop e2 is a natural but not critical. Therefore, we use these games as just as much to demonstrate some general stonewall concepts as to discuss opening theory. We shall soon enough encounter lines demanding black to follow a narrow path to equality. Okay. Let's go back to move 19. No, it wasn't this line I was looking at. Or was it? No. I was looking at the queen e8 line. Where is the queen e8 line? There it goes. No, not that line. So you can play knight here. Knight bd7, move 16. Okay, there we go, found it. Okay. So here they play a4. B catches on a3 en passant. Rook catches on a3. Rook c to b8. Bishop d4. This both of these bishops are really bad. Like they're they're not really hitting at anything. Right? They're stuck. Whereas these bishops have pretty good diagonals. And maybe if we get this here, bam. Or at least here we have this line here. Right? That's, that's, it just looks kind of funny. Rook b7, rook c1, rook a b8, bishop e3. Queen f8, putting some pressure here. Maybe, maybe in some lines. Maybe, I'm not sure. But now they definitely have to eye it. And king h1. White must have feared a kingside expansion, but this move doesn't seem to improve white's position. Actually, there now appears a back rank motif that later helps black. So bishop d8. This is mainly a preventative move. However, we suspect that black guessed white's intention and made this move with at least a faint hope that white would unsuspectingly continue his plan. And he played bishop d2 question mark. So this is a tactical oversight. After bishop f3, chances would have been roughly even. So instead of there, he should have just moved this bishop here. But now captures on d3. Even though this is black's so-called bad bishop, it has an excellent view from a6. So this exchange would have been pointless if it weren't for the tactical follow-up. E captures d3. Knight captures c5. Okay. This is very nice. I think here's the plan, right? This is very nice. Queen captures on c5. Bishop e7. Queen captures on c6. Rook b6. Interesting. So the queen cannot go here it cannot go here so it has here and here left and here and it can go here as well and there okay uh 
So there's uh, that the e pawn needs protection. If not for this zigzong, uh, black's combination might well have well backfired. So they said that they this is a much needed one because this pawn needs some help. Bishop captures a3. Rook a1. Question mark. White is an exchange down, but his B pawn is weak, and there are some tactical problems on his back rank. Black is close to winning. He played rook a1. Rook 8 to b7, saying, hey, queen, get out of here. Queen a4. Captures on b3. h3, preventing any background checkmates. And then h1, h3, we're captured on d3. Black is winning comfortably. Queen c6. Queen e7, holding everything. And if here, then we have this move. Queen c8 check, king f7, bishop catches a5, rook catches g3, rook d1, rook b2, getting more attackers over here, and developing, they say that if you have a rook on the 7th uh, row, it's worth a pawn. Rook on the 7th rank is at least worth one pawn. Um, so rook b2, rook d2, rook captures d2. Bishop captures d2, rook d3, queen c2. And I'm sorry for those of you who, in the chat, I, I will get back to you. I'm sorry I'm not... I have to just finish this. Rook d3, queen c2, rook d4. Bishop e3. Rook c4. Queen d3. Okay, and after queen d3, g6. Maybe solidifying this. Maybe I want to come in after this. C4, G6, Rook, King, H2. The King, H2. King, G7. Maybe I'm better placed over here. Who knows? Um, G7, Bishop, D2. Bishop, C1. Saying, hey, let's just trade off. And I'm also attacking this, right? If you move off the line, I'm attacking this. Bishop captures c1. Rook captures c1. Queen b5. Queen a7. Queen b4. Queen g1 check. King g3. Queen e1 check. Saying, hey, now we're going to trade off. And I'm going to be able to win this end game because, well, first of all, I'm up two pawns and I have a rook. So that was game four. And that was the instructive, uh, a lot of instructive games there. This is still the introduction. This is the uh, on move seven b3 variation that. They have us considering. Um, so that's it for the lesson. Uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. Hit the subscribe and the notification bell if you do like the content. And uh, we're here. And just letting you know, if you play the Dutch, you're always winning. Nani? Uh! And that's it for me. All right. <laughs> guys. The intro was still on. <laughs> so that was it for my YouTube bit. Um, and 
hopefully, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Let me know. And Lord Hagfish. Lord Hagfish. So how do you guys feel about the Dutch? What do you guys feel about the Dutch? I feel like I'm ready to kind of play the Dutch, but I know there's so many more variations to it that I kind of want to get like really booked up before I use it in a tournament. But like most of the ideas I'm understanding right now, like their white's main ploy is to try to control the e5 square and you try to trade off the dark square bishops. But even if they do try to play there, b6 is still a viable option. And after b6, um, if they play like queen c1, um, bishop a3, the knight bd7 and keeping your king to center might be more profitable.